Our next presentation is titled Bag, Mal Vast Ven Bag Mask Ven Ventilation during Tracheal Intubation of Critically Ill Adults and is presented by Dr. Casey of Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Good morning, my name is John Casey. I am a critical care physician from Vanderbilt University and I'm here today representing the Pragmatic Critical Care Research Group. And I'm here today to tell you about the results of our recently completed trial on bag mask ventilation during tracheal intubation of critically ill adults, the PREVENT trial, which was recently published in the New England Journal. I'm personally supported by the Vanderbilt K-12 for emergency care research, and this trial was supported more broadly by Vanderbilt CTSA. So why do we care about tracheal intubation? Well, it's common. 1.5 million patients are intubated each year in the U.S. alone. And despite the frequency of the procedure, the complication rates remain unacceptably high. In the ICU, 2 to 4 percent of intubations are complicated by cardiac arrest. Hypoxemia is the number one risk factor for cardiac arrest and death. Rapid sequence induction and intubation is one way to prevent hypoxemia. RSI is the nearly simultaneous administration of a sedative and a neuromuscular blockade agent. It involves this inherent delay from the administration of medications until the patient is sufficiently relaxed to allow laryngoscopy. Whether or not to provide prophylactic bag mass ventilation during this delay has been debated for 50 years. And the reason for this debate has been these hypothesized competing effects. Bag mass ventilation might prevent hypoxemia, but conversely might cause aspiration. There are two dominant approaches to bag mass ventilation. The first is shown here. This approach recommends avoiding bag mass ventilation except as treatment for hypoxemia. This is recommended by many guidelines, particularly in the emergency medicine literature. The converse approach is shown here. In this approach, all patients are provided with bag mask ventilation starting at induction. This approach is recommended by many other guidelines, particularly in the anesthesia literature. There's sadly little data to help providers choose between these two approaches. What little data does exist has largely been extrapolated from other settings, largely studies of healthy volunteers in the operating room for whom gastric insufflation was used as, as a surrogate for aspiration. And there have been no prospective clinical studies evaluating either the efficacy or safety a bag mask ventilation during emergency airway management. So we designed the PREVENT trial, the Preventing Hypoxemia with Manual Ventilation during Endotracheal Intubation trial to compare these two approaches. The trial was conducted in seven intensive care units in the United States. The inclusion criteria included adults undergoing tracheal intubation with, with sedation. Exclusion criteria included pregnant women, prisoners, any intubation that was too emergent to perform the randomization procedures and any intubation where the providers felt that ventilation was either required or contraindicated. Data was collected by an independent observer. Patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to bag mask ventilation or no ventilation. For patients randomized to bag mask ventilation, providers were instructed to use an oral airway, a two-handed mask seal, and to provide ventilation at 10 breaths per minute. For patients randomized to no bag mask ventilation, Operators were, in, were instructed not to provide prophylactic ventilation, but ventilation could be provided via bag mask with, for the treatment of hypoxemia or after a failed attempt. The primary outcome was lowest arterial oxygen saturation between induction and two minutes after intubation. The sole pre-specified secondary outcome was the incidence of severe hypoxemia defined as an oxygen saturation less than 80%. To ensure that we were robustly capturing our safety outcome of aspiration, we, we captured this in three different ways. The first was operator reported aspiration. The second was physiologic uh, parameters of oxygenation in the 24 hours after intubation. And the third was any new in, uh, chest x-ray infiltrate within 40 hours, 48 hours of intubation as adjudicated by central blinded review. 667 patients met all study inclusion criteria. Approximately 40% were excluded. Uh, the most common reason for exclusion was the requirement of ventilation, and only about 7% of patients were excluded for their risk of aspiration. 401 patients underwent randomization, 199 were assigned to bag mask ventilation, and 202 to no ventilation. Shown here are the baseline characteristics of the patients in the trial, which were well balanced between the two groups. The median age was approximately 60, median Apache 2 score was 22, and the most common indication for intubation was hypoxemic respiratory failure. All but one patient assigned to bag mask ventilation received prophylactic bag mask ventilation. Five patients in the, in the no ventilation group received pro prophylactic ventilation as crossovers. And then in another 39 patients, bag mask ventilation was provided for one of the approved indications of hypoxemia or after a failed attempt. 
So, 50 years of controversy about the role for bag mass ventilation during this period. What was the effect on oxygen saturation? Shown here is a scatter plot of the lowest oxygen saturation experienced from induction to two minutes after intubation for every patient in the trial. On the left is the bag mass ventilation group. On the right is the no ventilation group. The horizontal bars represent the median and interquartile range for each group. As you can see, bag mass ventilation was associated with a higher lowest oxygen saturation of 96%, median of 96%, compared to a median of 93% in the no ventilation group. Bag mass ventilation could affect the average saturation in all patients, or it could prevent extreme cases. So in addition to looking at lowest oxygen saturation as a continuous variable, we looked at these various safety thresholds of severe hypoxemia. Shown here is the sole pre-specified secondary outcome of severe hypoxemia, defined as an oxygen saturation less than 80%. In the bag mass ventilation group, severe hypoxemia occurred in 10.9% of cases compared to 22.8% of cases in the no ventilation group. This difference would be associated with a number needed to treat of nine patients to prevent one case of severe hypoxemia. This is the forest plot showing the effect of bag mass ventilation in the pre-specified subgroups. As you can see, the effect appeared to be consistent across all subgroups. These are the safety and exploratory clinical outcomes. There was no evidence of difference in aspiration between groups. Operator reported aspiration was numerically lower in the bag mask ventilation group, occurring in 2.5% of cases compared to 4% of cases in the no ventilation group. There were no differences in chest x-ray infiltrates or physiologic parameters of oxygenation. Furthermore, there were no differences in, clinical in the exploratory clinical outcomes, including cardiac arrest, ventilator free days, ICU free days, or in hospital mortality. So the strengths of the PREVENT trial included the conduct at multiple centers with a broad range of provider specialties and training levels, which should increase generalizability. Additional strengths included randomization with concealed allocation to prevent selection bias and the collection of trial endpoints by an independent observer. The limitations included being underpowered to provide definitive assessment of the risk of aspiration and being enrolling all patients in an ICU setting. So qu common questions we've received since the completion of the trial have included, did you exclude all patients who are at risk for aspiration? So shown here again are, are the reasons for exclusions from our construct diagram. As mentioned, only 7% of patients were excluded for the risk of aspiration, and almost all of those had active emesis, hematemesis, or, hemop hemotemesis or hemoptysis. Only three patients were excluded for the reason of having a full stomach. Shown here uh, are the risk factors for aspiration amongst the patients who were enrolled in the trial. Only half of patients were known to be NPO at the time of enrollment, and approximately 60% had at least one risk factor for aspiration. So I'm a critical care physician. All these patients were enrolled in the ICU. I think the question that has come up a lot, particularly in a setting like this, is does this apply to my patients, particularly patients in the emergency department? Shown here are the rates of hypoxemia and aspiration that were observed in the PREVENT trial. And we frequently heard from ED providers that hypoxemia is less common and aspiration is more common in their settings. So I want to show you what data we have on the rates of those, those two outcomes in the emergency department. So shown here are some data from trials of airway management in the ED. The NDAO trial was a trial of apneic oxygenation and the BEAM trial was a trial of bougie for first pass success. And it does appear that the incidence of hypoxemia is lower in the emergency department, occurring in these two trials between 13 and 16% of cases, but still is a significant problem occurring frequently. Rates of aspiration are shown here from the BEAM trial and from the NEAR registry. Shown the rates of aspiration seem to range from anywhere from one to 5%, not dissimilar from the rates of aspiration seen in the PREVENT trial. That being said, I think we can all agree that there are many reasons why patients in the ED would be higher risk for aspiration. They're, they're closer to their last meal, and they, they are likely to have other reasons why they'd be high risk. I think the question is not the baseline risk of aspiration. The question is whether or not this intervention affects that risk. And I think we haven't definitively answered that question, but the PREVENT trial should give us some modicum of safety of believing that that, that bag mass ventilation doesn't appear to dramatically increase that risk. So in conclusion, among critically ill adults undergoing tracheal intubation in the intensive care unit, bag mass ventilation resulted in a higher oxygen saturation and a lower incidence of severe hypoxemia. Although not powered to detect differences in aspiration, the results are reassuring regarding the safety of bag mass ventilation. And we do think validation is needed in other patient populations and settings, particularly patients in the emergency department. I want to thank all of the members of the Pragmatic Critical Care Research Group, many of whom are represented here today, and I'd be happy to take questions.
Thank you, Dr. Casey, for outstanding work. Take our first question at the front mic. Uh, Mark Courtney, Northwestern University. Um, really provocative. Uh, this may have been addressed, and I may have missed it, but I think it's worth maybe commenting on again. But what, what was the endpoint instructions of duration or oxygen endpoint for the, the operators of the back valve mask ventilation? And can you comment on how uh, that was followed or whether you think that was associated with an, an optimal choice? Yeah, it's a great question. So the, the instruction we gave to providers was that there's already this inherent delay required for the medications to take effect. And the idea was that the providers would provide ventilation, bag mass ventilation during that interval. So there was no intent to prolong the duration before they began the intubation procedure. However, uh, we didn't, it's shown in the paper and not shown in these slides, the duration of intubation, the duration between the administration of medications and the beginning of laryngoscopy was longer in the bag mass ventilation group. And that seems to imply that when patient, when operators chose to bag, they, they delayed the point at which they started laryngoscopy. That, that likely, I believe, is cases where the oxygen saturation was, was improving and operators elected to continue uh, bagging until they seemed to reach some maximal benefit. This, was, this, wasn't, this wasn't bag valve mask to a certain oxygenation level or to improve. To, this was just while you are preparing for laryngoscopy. That's the intent, okay. is that you already have this delay. Do you just watch, wait, and do nothing, or do you provide ventilation during that required delay? Okay, our next question at the second mic in the middle. Uh, Walt Trading, UAB. Um, these uh, patients did not receive passive oxygenation during the intubation attempt, is that correct? So uh, about 60 to 70 percent of patients received uh, apneic oxygenation. The other 30 percent uh, had received either bag mass, uh, bag mass ventilation as pre-oxygenation or BiPAP, and that was removed at the time of induction. I see, okay. Other questions? Thank you, Dr. Casey. Thank you. Moving right along.